Hey, welcome to 10X Your Team with Cam and Otis. We're a father-son leadership podcast where we talk with other lifelong learners about making an impact and solving big problems. And man, uh, I've just gotten over a problem. Those of you are are regular listeners probably hearing it in my voice right now. Uh, But all better on the uphill swing and uh, seems like uh, things in the desert are going pretty good too, right, Cam? Yeah, no, th- things are good out here just trying to deal with these temperature swings. We're hitting 79 today, and it was 35 last night. So it's just weird. Just a weird time of year out here. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of temperature swings, those folks in Chicago don't have to worry about it this time of year because it's just <laughs> cold. Isn't that right, cold. Andy? We got snow last night. Now, it, it melted, but oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, not, you know, my, my one visit to Chicago was in November, and that was a – not a good choice of the time of year to visit uh, the Windy City. That's all I can say. A lot of folks, you know, they want to come out and visit. I say aim May to early October. That's your, yeah. I mean, you'll love the city then. Anytime oh, after yeah. that, it, it'll be rough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was uh, It was very fitting of the Windy City when Miss Suzanne and I were there. So, yeah, we got a full taste of it. <laughs> so, Andy, uh Scaling minds. We just talked about this uh, in the green room, rebranding, and there's nothing more exciting because we, in case you didn't catch it, we just rebranded the podcast. I saw it. Surprise. Uh, also, so I always love to hear well, what happened. What was the what was the thought process that got you to say, "All right, screw it, let's move and do this." Um, well. Honestly, I've never really loved going by my name, but when I started coaching, I wasn't creative. I had no idea what to name a business. Um, So I'm like, well, let's just start with Andy Height Coaching. Um, But since, you know, in the past five years, we've grown and we brought some some folks on and it just didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, I struggled. I wouldn't say struggled, but I really searched for several months to find a name that resonated with me and what we do and you know, that, that fun logo that goes with it. Um, and once we landed on scaling minds, I felt like, ah, that's what we do. We, we help people not just grow, but like scale who they are. Could, could you walk us through a bit of that thought process? Cause that's a fascinating thing to understand because everybody does it a little bit different, but I think, uh, I'd love to hear your, your thought process for how you came up with scaling minds. <laughs> um, there were a couple of uh, AI tools that I just used to ideate, and I probably went through, no joke, maybe 2,000 names. It would come up, and I'd be like, oh, that's stupid. Ooh, I like that word, but that sounds very, you know, um, pompous, you know. So I kind of found about 10 that I liked on various levels. I let it ruminate for a couple of weeks. Um, I sought counsel of friends and colleagues. What do you think? Uh, and narrowed it down to a few. Um, and then really I woke up one day and I'm like, this is what we do. You know, we work with business owners to scale. It was a nice play on scaling. Um, and so scaling minds, I really believe in the growth of the human is the thing that changes all of leadership and all of business. So scaling minds seem to really fit and it's resonated really well with folks. I get comments uh, often saying, Ooh, I love the name. And that makes me feel pretty good. You know, it, it sounds like you had to go through a little bit of this balance. We've done the same with like tribe and purpose where when you have such a big, great offer like that, you start talking about, you know, scaling minds and what it does to unlock leadership and all these different kinds of things. It can really be really easy to get into the, like, I think you said pompous range and these kind of things. Yeah. How did you, how did you keep that balance of like, look, here's the big promise. Cause you know, you can deliver that, but at the yeah. same time, it's like, you know, if you put, I, I'll change your life as the name of the program. It's like, all right, that's a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> there were, there were a lot of those that came up like, um, soul catalyst and, um, uh, the greatest coach or like just random <laughs> stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> that's, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be a guy who does really good, meaningful work. And that just felt like home. You know, I also just wanted something that rang in my ear because I, mm-hmm. I felt like if it rings for me, it'll ring for others. And I, I really wanted to a logo that, that, 
represented what that was. If you haven't seen it, our logo is sort of a, a tree with roots that grows up into what looks like a tree, but is actually a mind, a brain. Um, and s secretly, it is takes the place of the eye and mind. And, you know, the eye is what's really important to me. Um, so things just started to fall into place. Um, and yeah, we're, we're loving it and it's resonating. In that kind of vein, how did you, uh, how did you help to prevent the shiny object syndrome in the rebrand? Cause I know the naming process can be really fun. You know, us entrepreneurs get in there and can have a lot of fun with it. How did you stay in one direction there? So I really have a very difficult time focusing <laughs> with that. I had to tell myself I'm not doing this work during work. So oftentimes I'd, you know, just be sitting on the couch with that AI tool or ideating um, because man, can I waste some time? I just posted something on LinkedIn yesterday that a client came up with, but I'm going to start using, which is we all have to-do lists. I, this client and I need a to-don't list. <laughs> that thing like don't scroll, don't, you know, multitask get rid of people that suck your energy and just like plaster it right there. Um, cause I'm, I'm reliable to get some work done, but I can, as you say, shiny object, I can get confused and all over the place. I'd love to dive in on that to don't list. Cause I think that's something I I've done a few times with myself. I not consistently, but I've had a couple of days where it's like, all right, Hey, don't do these five things today. And you can get a lot more done. Talk us through a little bit of that process. Well, I, honestly, I, I, I learned so much from work with my clients that this is why I am going to implement it. We were working on um, him remaining kind of focused. You know, he always complained that he would lose focus. He would lose energy um, and not really get to the things that we talked about getting to. Um, he loved lists, love lists. So I'm like, well, let's create a to don't list and plaster it on your computer. Um, and it, it was everything from scrolling, which I can doom scroll all day long if I don't check myself. Um, he was in an office and there were some like energy vampires there. And we, we were like, you have to isolate yourself because they're just drawing way too much of your, your energy, which energy is the creative force, right? Um, what else? Uh, perfectionism. He had to remind himself just put it out there. Just do the thing. We came up with an imperfectionist. Be an imperfectionist. So yeah, finding those things that kind of derail us and documenting it, putting it right in front of us, just like we do our goals or our to-do list, just as powerful. Now, when you do that, are you, do you allocate some time for that? So it's not like, you know, like, like one of the, the big faults of diets is, mm -hmm. you know, cut this stuff out. And if you're not willing to be extremely disciplined in that cut it all out starting today, it's extreme. It, you're setting yourself up for failure, right? So do you, do you, especially like with scrolling, uh, because, you know, we all love that dopamine hit, right? I deleted so, some of the apps. I just had to delete yeah. them. So yeah. do you, but do you allow yourself scrolling time in your day? Yep. Um, I deleted TikTok because that was just a a brain melter, like nothing good. Uh, it's just sugar. Yep. Nothing. Same here. Yeah. Um, uh, and I don't yeah. do anything on it. I don't post on it. Um, but I occasionally do post on Instagram. So I've kept that and I put a time limit on the screen thing. I only get 30 minutes a day and never during work. Um, but in terms of like revisiting um, and you talk about dieting, oftentimes the reason why people have a hard time sticking with it is because they don't have a clear and concise why. Why would I do this? Why would I cut this out? Why would I eat the salmon instead of the burger? Um, and a lot of the work that we do with clients first and foremost is define the goals and the why. Mm -hmm. So that that is the thing that's always the, the lighthouse. And you know, for this particular client, um, he set an alarm on his phone, um, I think every two hours, to just say, hey, read your to don't list as a reminder. <laughs> we got to oh, we got to put in our guardrails, right? Sometimes we just got to use whatever we have at our disposal to help us move forward. And it's working for him, right? 
Yeah, I love what you said about the why there, because actually, Dad, with your diet's example, it always brings to mind a study, and this is an older one, so it might be a little bit outdated, but there's a really interesting piece of it about different diets and which ones are more effective. And one of the things that they found in this study was that the most effective diet uh, in, in their sample groups was the vegan diet. And the reason was because they had the strongest why for it, or at least that was the hypothesis of the study. The idea that, look, if I'm just cutting out something just to lose a little bit of weight, that's difficult, you know, it, it's especially if it's not very strict, you know, like guardrail, like you said, Andy, isn't very clear. It can be really difficult. But if it's a hard line, look, I'm saving animals and I'm doing this. And none of those things, all the, all these really hard lines make it easier for you to get an idea of what your why is and then how you can move forward with that. Uh, Andy, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about your experience getting that why behind the to don't list. And then also, I think, bringing that background to the to, the to do list side of things. Yeah. Well, I just want to share because I've been vegetarian for 15 years. It's not vegan, but it's vegetarian. Um, and you can I was get gonna chubby say, I might be mistaken. Too. I think I, I think I read that study at college. So <laughs> it's been you, you can get chubby on vegetarianism, too. Right? <laughs> the best the best diet is the one that works. Yeah. Right. They all all of them will work. It's just if we have a clear why we'll stick with whatever diet is there. You know, I had to, and I'm still working on it, um, really think about my future and my kids and my grandkids. That has become part of my health why, because I don't want to be selfish today and eat the thing that is just, you know, Im immediately gratifying and cost me later. We oftentimes in our, in our house talk about the decision we make and how it affects our future self. Mm -hmm. And so I think about that a lot. Um, so I got lost in our, our vegetarian vegan and I, I lost your, uh, original question. Yeah. Just of how to build in that why into, you know, whether it's a to do list, to don't list, whatever it is, that why is so important. It's like, what's the trick, or I guess your approach to building that why into those different actions. Gosh, however, the person across me will, um, engage in the act activity. One of the, one of the things that I like to do is I'm sure you've heard of the seven layers of why mm -hmm. that exercise. We'll do things like that. You know, oftentimes business owners will come in and they're like, I want to 10 X my business. Great. We can help you do that. Um, it's going to require a lot and you're going to, you better have a strong why. And so we start to ask, well, what will that get you? Great. Well, I'll, I'll have more money in the bank. Great. What will that get you? Well, I'll have a little bit, um, more freedom to do X, Y, or Z. Great. What will that get you? So we get down to the, usually what most people want is some sort of freedom or um, ability to just be themselves outside of the fear of scarcity. And so we get them clear on that so that they can then use that as their North Star or their guiding light. When you've done that, which is, <clears throat> which is great. I love that process. Uh, uh, I remember, I can't remember where I heard it from, but a, a derivative of that is what do you want? Yeah. You know, great coaching you, question. You know, yeah. Yeah. What is it you want? And then most of the time, what they're wanting is for somebody else is to do something for somebody <laughs> yeah. else is not really what they truly want. So that's a, it's a powerful place to be. And yeah. And those seven layers of why is, is a great thing to do. Once you, once you have them to where they, 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 come to terms and agree that, yes, this is my why. How do you, how do you have them develop their goals from there? Uh, I love this part. Um, you guys work with small business owners. Yeah. Um, yep. One of the things that I have found is that is the hardest question for entrepreneurs to answer is what do you really want? And what does that goal look like? Um, nine times out of 10, I'd almost say 10 times out of 10, they are not dreaming big enough. You know, they are dreaming and setting goals in the realm of what's predictable for them to achieve and not necessarily in the realm of possibility, what might they achieve outside of their current skills and knowledge and mindset. And so usually what I'll do is I'll have them set their goals and then say, great, now go away and raise them because I know whatever that is, you can do it. No, I know it. And there's no growth in that, right? We only grow from the things that challenge us, that are outside of our comfort zone, that are outside of our current skill set and knowledge. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I love that. I'm interested, though, how would you... Uh, I don't know if square is the right word, because usually you say square when you're square in two things. These are three things, though. Uh, but, you know, that idea of dreaming big and, like, pushing yourself beyond that so you can actually grow with the... Uh, the need to have it be either realistic or I think you get into this, like this area of ambition to where it almost becomes to start feeling pompous of like, I can't go do all of these different things. And then that also could just be imposter syndrome at the end of the day. So those three can all kind of fight in different directions there. How how do you square those? Well, first I say, and I'm going to use relatively good language here, screw realistic. What, what does that do? Hmm. Right. Les Brown has a great quote, shoot for the moon. Worst case scenario, you you land among the stars. If we don't reach for something that's outside our reach, there's no growth there, hmm. right? We can, we can help people, you know, grow their business by 20, 30%. But what about grow that business, exit it, and then buy a new business? Or what about growing a portfolio of businesses? I have a client now, I love working with this dude. He was running a uh, content marketing firm. I think they were maybe doing 2 million. Uh, When we started working together, he wanted to grow it to five within two years. I was like, dude, come on. How, you know you can do that. Dream bigger. And he actually took the challenge. He went away and within two weeks he came back and said, I want to create a portfolio of companies that are gross, uh, that are bringing in revenues of a hundred million dollars a year. So there's ten companies. That dude is looking to buy his third company now. What would happen if I we didn't challenge him to look beyond what was predictable? He'd probably be at four million in that one company. He's already there and buying his third. So I am all about stretching into the the land of possibility ver- versus getting what's predictable. You know, in, in that vein, then, because uh, I think this is something that uh, is, is another one of those little pitfalls that people can fall into. Then as you're setting these really big goals, yes, you know, shoot for the moon, land among the stars. But if all I want is the moon, Andy, and all I want to get over and over is the moon, and I just keep landing in the stars, that still could be a little, little bit of a negative space. So uh, how do you help people to avoid that pitfall? So are you saying that they keep going for the moon and keep landing at the stars? Right. And so the idea is, yes, that's still good. But because you're looking past it, you still will, you still feel that uh, it's kind of a little bit of like the endowment effect of since you want this, that negative feels worse than the positive that you're getting. Yeah, I think if I'm understanding, like, part of it is just our relationship to what the results are. And I try and work with clients to reframe the context of their relationship to the results. Because that's always going to dictate a mood, feeling or emotion. You either hit it or you didn't. You feel good about yourself or you didn't. We want to get rid of those contexts because they're limiting. So aim for the moon. You might hit it. I kind of don't want you to because that's it's like the carrot that's going to keep going. But when you say, for example, you're, you're doing round numbers, a million in revenue, and you shoot for the moon and you want five, hmm. you hit four. I have people that are like, dang it, I didn't get it. Stop that. Stop that relationship to, you know, we're, we're programmed to be disappointed when we don't get stuff. Stop. Celebrate the fact that you just, you know, uh, grew from one to three. Getting a little ahead of myself, but it, it's, it seems. I live ahead like of myself. Right. Oh, this. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and well, that's, this, that's good because that's what this question is. So when we're talking about stretching, we're talking about stretching your clients. What are you stretching into? Um, me really, I'm stretching into growing the business. Um, I'm working on this with my coach right now. Um, she is doing what I do with clients and pushing the heck out of me out of my comfort zone. And I'm kicking and screaming. Um, also like not just business stuff, but lifestyle stuff. My wife and I really want to, um, have enough money. Our kids are getting ready to go to college to come down towards you, Camden like get out of Chicago, at least for the winters. And so we, we really have a lot of lifestyle goals fueled. That's our, that's my why, um, which fuels the revenue goals and the, the growth goals. But even as I talk to you about it, my stomach starts to go, Oh God, Oh God. 
and I'm working on my relationship to that. Oh God. Mm. What about you guys? Are you it's, stretching? Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm stretching. I, I mean, I, my why I got to say, the why is to build the, the home for the family. You know, we bought our house earlier this year, looking around an old house building 47, lots of projects. But again, that's all the why behind the business goals. And I, I do love the stretch one. I've used this example on a couple of podcasts I was on. Of like, I talk about like drinking water, you know, all those really basic things of like get a gallon a day. My goal is always two gallons because I will always hit one. It's yeah. guaranteed I'll hit one if I'm always shooting for two. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit of a hack, and let's use it, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I love the water example. Miss Suzanne was doing that for a while, too, and shooting for a gallon and getting in three quarters, which was pretty amazing. You know, and when you hit that goal, that's uh, that's pretty amazing, too. And I'll tell you, for for me on my side, that stretch goal is, is to grow Tribe and Purpose, is to grow our mastermind uh, to grow our leadership development program and, and even start to, uh, include retreats for those clients that want to, want to do that because, uh, don't tell them this when they sign up. I got a lot of work to do at the ranch. Uh, be nice <laughs> to have some help. Two birds with <laughs> one stone. I love it. <laughs> We're just developing to be resiliency. <laughs> get, get all that fire and bring it over here. Speak, Doug, and <laughs> I love always it. got a hole that needs to be dug and filled back in right there <laughs> oh yeah man. i got lots of those <laughs> so uh andy you know kind of yeah. going from the like big picture with the stretch goals uh how do you help your clients to take those breaking them down not not to those i'd say like medium range goals but more so into like those daily actions and kind of building that goal and connecting it to reality a little bit yeah so oftentimes you know we we have the the big save in three or five year goal we we parse that down into okay what do we have to do this year and then we parse that down into quarters and months and oftentimes what i like to do and it depends on the person and the type of business um i am a big believer in process goals I, if I do these things every day, I will reasonably get these results. Um, you know, if it's in sales, um, I post this many times or make this many calls or this many emails or have this many one-on-ones, whatever that is for the business owner. I really love process goals, things that we can track on a daily basis or weekly basis to know, hey, I did the stuff this week that's going to get me to the one, three, five, 10 year goals. Mm -hmm. And we track it. Oftentimes I, I made, I don't know if I have it here, um, a little book for myself that you can't really see it, but it has a lot of my process goals on it. A few of my clients mm -hmm. who have similar, I've just gotten on Canva, written them out, printed off pages and had it bound and sent it to them. Track it every day. Mm -hmm. Can you oh, talk a little bit? more on the advantage of like the process goal versus the uh like the outcome goal for the day because I, I think that's a I, I wrote that down not in my podcast notes but for all my camden notes for yeah. after this because I, I really love the way you approach that yeah so like i we talked about this early on i can get lost in a shiny object right and so if i just have a goal to x by the end of the day i'm likely gonna scroll for two hours or be on a conversation with a, a colleague way too long or whatever those things are. But if I have a process goal, I know that by the end of the day, I have to do these five things. I have to make this many phone calls. I have to set up this many one-on-ones. I have to um, draft this many proposals or book this many speaking gigs, whatever that is. It really helps keep me on track for the, the smaller goals that get to the bigger goals. Speaking of that, that growth, and, and we, we kind of skipped ahead to the rebranding because of the growth of your business. Let's step back and hit the point of when you decide, all right, I, I want to scale more than I can do and how you did that, how you, you know, walk us through that, that thought process and, and even how you found that first guy or gal to bring in the team. It was pretty easy. Um, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> Something's got to change. <laughs> you know, in this world of coaching, um, often it is uh, time for dollars, right? And it's just not possible because there is a finite amount of time, 
right? We can keep raising rates, um, but and my coach is working with me on this. I, I have a problem just arbitrarily going, we're just going to add X amount of thousands on top. Like I, it's just hard for me to do, right? Um, there's a lot of coaches out there that do it. Um, but it, it, it was really the only way to continue to grow. And so once that was clear, okay, do we, is the why there, uh, do we know what we want to achieve? Well, then the path forward is to do this. What was one of those early pitfalls once you made that decision? Cause yeah, the, the decision seems pretty clear. That doesn't mean it was an easy road ahead. Take us through a little bit of that first, you know, first couple pitfalls maybe. Uh, I mean, it's literally like walking into the dark, having no clue what you're doing. Right. <laughs> it's so, I don't know if you guys experienced this, like, if it's a client, super easy because I can get altitude on it. I can help them get altitude on it. When it's me, I feel like I'm absolutely in the woods, which is why I have a coach. I couldn't do it without it. Um, yeah. So everything from processes to people, not getting the right people. Um, how do I market? How do I hand off potential work or clients? Like, and we're still trying to figure that out. Hmm. I was going to say, cause that's, that's always one of the big things is I want to, I want to talk to Andy. Right. Another like reason the guy that, minds, not Andy high coaching. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that's a, that's a, I don't know if I'd call that humbling because I think you, you named the company that out of convenience, not out of uh, arrogance, just judging by how well we know each yeah. other. Uh, and there's an interesting shift in that mindset of, of being able to hand things off and trust your team as a process guy, what processes or data do you collect that you're checking your team to make sure that they are following your values, which I love your values, which are on the website mm -hmm. folks. Uh, but that they are staying within those values. How are you doing that? Well, it's hard. Because I, it's really hard. All right, next question. <laughs> well, like I, I take such great pride in the work that I do. Um, and I, I have a really hard time, especially when it was my name, like having my name and transferring that off and not being able to ensure quality or ensure anything. And so the few people that I do work with, I know them. I've seen them coach. Like I've seen with my own eyes, I've seen them socially, um, if, if not in person, but online, I like, I feel them. I know that we are somewhat kindred. Um, and then it's like experiment, try it. Did it work? Was the client happy? Are they renewing or, the, you know, that kind of thing. So it's all like just figuring out as we go, people, as you know, people in my business, your business or any other, it's the hardest part of the whole darn thing. Uh, could you talk some about the, uh, the, the the phrase that's coming to mind is like controlling the outcome there and the sense of like when you have other coaches working for you, it's like, yeah, it could be all your business model. Yeah, your values, all that kind of stuff. But then getting it to actually come out the way that Andy wants it to is a little bit different there. So how do you, I guess, twofold part of twofold question. How do you help to control that outcome? And then also, how do you accept that little bit of variance, which is going to naturally come? Yeah, a really excellent question that I think um, a lot of business owners um, can relate to. I think at the end of the day, on some level, you can't control the outcome because there's another person mm. involved, right? It's That's where we get into alignment. Um, and so what we, the only thing we can do, and and hopefully any business owner out there, they're hiring people that are culture fits, that have the same sort of beliefs and values, that have same sort of goals, because that's going to have everybody rowing in the same direction. But we can't control any of it because there's another person, nor do we really want to. We just have to share what our ultimate outcomes are want to be collectively agree on them and hope that they go out and achieve that. 
Uh, I love that because that, I, you know, talking coaching takes me in my rugby space. I was thinking of some examples with uh, the little kids with Engage, but it's like there's always in rugby, especially because you have all these different places that people come from. But it's but even any kind of coaching, you get into this like semantics problem sometimes of it's like, hey, well, you know, like to take Engage as the example, Dad, you know, our elephant trunk. There's a, probably a million different things you could call that elephant trunk to teach the kids how to pass a ball. But we call it an elephant trunk. And that's one of those where it's like that becomes a standard and we teach the coaches that and those kind of things. But at the end of the day, that's not my outcome. The outcome isn't the elephant trunk. The outcome is passing the ball. Heck yeah. And like understanding that distinction and when you can go hands off on the semantics a little bit and let someone else run with it, I think is a huge piece as a leader. There. That is leadership. That in itself is leadership. You know, agreeing on what the goal is, first off, that's what we have to do as leaders is enroll the people that work with us enroll them in an, uh, in an agreed and understandable goal and then help them achieve it. You know, one of my favorite quotes is Simon Sinek, you know, leadership is not being in charge. It's taking care of those in your charge. Uh, my way, your way might be the elephant trunk, but they might have something brand new that actually works better for them. Right. And it's, it's having that relationship to allow them to express themselves in a way that ultimately gets to the goal. Because at the end of the day, I don't think any of us care how they get there as long as they get there. Yeah, and I think the other piece there is when you give people that freedom, the the way that people are going to naturally change the language on those kind of things is probably going to fit better for the environment there. Yeah. Like, Dad, this is – sorry, going a little bit hi hyper-specific on rugby here. But, Dad, remember we, we called the, the blitz drift defense. Colorado, you could hear that called the hockey stick. I called that hockey stick defense in Arizona. I got laughed at. They're like, what the hell are you talking about, coach? It's like, oh, yeah, well, because you guys don't know hockey. So hockey stick doesn't naturally go, oh, it's this. Like, it just doesn't come naturally to them. But if you go to coach a bunch of boys in Colorado, that's something they're going to pick up right away. So, as and again, from a leadership perspective, being able to give that freedom to people, let them innovate in those little tiny ways, you're going to get a better result out of it. A good leader always meets the other person where they're at. They don't require them to come over to where they are. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and so often that's what's missed in uh, the leadership landscape nowadays. It's still the world of management. Leadership is, is sparse in the corporate world. There's a lot of management, but what we want to do is enroll um, leaders to be leaders and not simply managers. No, that is, that is such a great way of putting it. And I, I, I've, I work really hard on that because uh you know, I hear people talk about toxic leadership and I'm always like, it's not leadership if it's toxic. That's exactly right. You know, That's it, bad management. I mean, it seems kind of anal, but I mean, yeah, yeah it, it, exactly. It's bad management. It is a person toxic who's leadership. in charge. It doesn't even exist. <laughs> yeah. yeah that, that's, that's, that's what it boils down to. It is not leadership at all. It is just mm -hmm. an asshole that has, has the title of the job. Yeah. So, uh, leadership uh, is not titles, is not position, is not rank. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you remind me, and I haven't shared this, I don't, I don't think, on anything, but it, it reminds me of something we talk about uh, in the special forces world when we're dealing with uh, guerrilla forces. You know, it's not the, it's not always the guerrilla chief. And folks, uh, you got to read some books if you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's not always the guerrilla chief who is the most important guy. There might be an ops officer or somebody else who is the real guy that you need to connect with. I'm sure you see that in businesses. Have you, have you run into that where a client has hired you and then you find out that his, his number two or even a, a, a third down the line is the guy that's really getting things done? All the time. Literally all the time. <laughs> and honestly, you know, if you're the visionary founder, you want that number two. You want that that other ops person or boots on the ground that can get the stuff done. You know, a lot of, um, I imagine several of people that you guys work with implement EOS. Do you work with folks in that? As, oh, as yeah. Framework, yeah. We have a good buddy of ours that's an EOS guy. Say again? We have a good buddy of ours who's been on the show a couple of times who's an EOS guy, uh, Hark, yeah. Hark Harrell. Yeah, as a framework, it makes yeah. perfect sense. You have the visionary. You want that person thinking future, thinking big, thinking, you know, creating relationships. Um, but somebody's got to be 
the implementer on the ground making all of it work. And that when you find those two people or group of people, businesses tend to really, really click. That's where a lot of solopreneurs or smaller business struggle because they are either a visionary or an implementer. You know, they, they lean one of those ways and they don't have that other part of the brain, that other partner that can really help get them to the next level. Well, I was just going to agree with them on that, but then ask a completely off offline commer uh, commercial. Yeah, you can tell I'm still recovering. Welcome to the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're a leadership commercial. No, what, what, I, what I wanted to what I wanted to jump to was, you know, doing a little bit of bio research on you, and you were on the stage for what four years mm -hmm. when you were younger. And I'm always fascinated. We had a guy who does coaching now who uh, does stand up com comedy, and you know went through process training and all that to to do that. So I'm, I always love hearing about. Well, what did you learn by being on the stage? And I'm I'm assuming we're talking plays, yeah. live plays live and musicals, music, yeah, right? but on stage, yeah, yeah. Um, a ton. So part of what to what it is to be a good actor is to be ultra present and listening. Oftentimes, so part of what I did in my previous career is I would also coach acting. And more often than not, I was working on the psychological aspects of an actor than I was the actual instrument of them speaking the words or singing the songs. They, we all get lost in, in the future or in the past, regret or stress and anxiety, and nothing good comes from that. So on stage, if you're not fully present with the person in front of you, listening alive with what's happening, it's not a good performance. It's not real. Audiences can sniff it. Same thing I do with, with, with my clients in business. Like what are the projections? What are the fears? What are the, the, the things that you're carrying from the past, the beliefs that are getting in your way of just doing the thing, selling the thing, building the thing. Um, those are often the obstacles that we're tearing down so that they can go, uh, create whatever it is they want to create. I, I'd love if you could talk some about, you know, talking about, you know, the, the past and the future distracting. One of the things I think is really interesting uh, is this, you know, you mentioned like the stress and anxiety look in the future. I think there's the other side of that also, which is the excitement. If you could be so excited about how big your goals are and all these kind of things. And it, it's, I don't know if they're necessarily two sides of the same coin, but it definitely contributes to the same kind of problems, I would say. What, what are your thoughts on that of kind of keeping yourself present there? Um, it, I believe it is the two sides to the same coin. There's a great cartoon um, that I see on social when I doom scroll. Uh, and it's of two cartoon guys sitting on a bus and the bus is driving down a, a really rocky road on the one side is just scraggly cliffs. And on the other is a beautiful Vista. And basically the point of it is there's one guy staring off at the cliffs and he is stressed and anxious. Mm -hmm. and the other guy's just enjoying the Vista. All of those are possible. We actually choose how we want to view it. You know, mm. everything is a choice. Now, a lot of folks will say, yeah, but the market forces and this and that all the time, right? Things do happen. But if we learned anything from Viktor Frankl in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, even in the worst of times, he learned in the midst of the Holocaust, nothing could be taken away, everything could be taken away from him except for his power to choose how he viewed his life and the meaning in it. So if he can do it, we can learn to do it. And when we do, doors open. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's one of my favorite things and I love reminding myself of it, not just my clients, myself of, hey, it's a choice, man. It's all a choice. You know, I, I always joke. I was just on a client just a little bit ago and I always joke about the fact of uh, I almost lost it because there's a squirrel literally outside my window, but I'm back. Uh, so, <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> squirrel. Literally a squirrel. Uh, but it is the fact that somebody put sprinkles on my ice cream. I still get to choose whether or not those sprinkles make me happy. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's still a choice. It is not 
sprinkles make me happy. I still have to choose that. And that's a powerful thing. How do you, how do you shape that in with your clients so that, so that they can start to learn and understand that, that they truly get to choose. This is like my favorite part of the work, which is to help reframe perspectives, change contexts. So we do a lot and we get to the belief level of, okay, I see that you're stressed and you're struggling. Um, you want to move in this direction, but you're finding obstacles. What are you believing that is causing that? Right. And they'll, they may come back with, well, you know, COVID created this. And I'm like, fair. Is there, for example, another marketing company that is five people and they're doing $3 million and still succeeding? Is that possible? Yeah. So it might be possible for you. So it's just giving them a little bit of daylight to look at things differently, to, to imagine things differently, to, uh, to lay down their assumptions and look for other possibilities. And then we'll do exercises like, okay, well, if you need to, for example, create revenue right now, um, we're not going to leave this call until you write down 20 ideas. Mm -hmm. Make them stretch. And they write, might write down 17 terrible ones, but there's probably three that they can go and do. You know, I always like to joke uh, in my brainstorming, especially thinking back to my verbi days, they're all producer Norman. Of It's like whatever we do, whether it's a pre-mortem brainstorming, whatever it is, it's always like I'd say the second to last idea is almost always the best one. Yeah. That last one usually is BS at that point because you got to keep pushing till you hit the BS. But that second to last one usually gets some good stuff in there. Yeah. Yeah, we just, I, I've um, even found that in our in our mastermind, you know, my, one of my masterminds that I run, I found the same thing. You know, that silence and in that pause, that next idea so many times is, is so powerful and so spot on. Yeah, I love that exercise and I hate it when my coach tells me to do it. <laughs> yeah. well, I, bet. I bet you do. Uh, you know, Andy, one other thing, and we, we've kind of touched on this, but just into just in like the psychology of the entrepreneur, uh, this is one where. Honestly, it's on my mind because I was cutting the clip that comes out later today on our podcast channel from a previous episode. But talking about the idea of like pressure creating excellence versus like the idea of the safety net making you feel more comfortable so you can excel. Uh, you know, the idea, you, the, the idea being that the safety net, it might make you feel more comfortable, but it also because you're comfortable, you might not push yourself or anything like that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that or if you've had any experience with clients in that kind of area. Yeah, I think I think most people have some version of the thing that makes them uncomfortable and it's much easier to just sit in the safety net. What I like to do is help them see the context that they're wrapped in. You know, oftentimes if those are the two options, they're in a context of all or nothing. Well, I, if I go this direction, I'm definitely, I'm going for this thing and I'm definitely going to be stressed and anxious and pressure filled. And the only other option is to stay here in the safety net. Well, I'm like, well, hmm. again, going back to the questioning, what, what's a third option? What's a fourth option? Hmm. And why does it have to be all or nothing? Why can't you have a little bit of safety, a little runway and also stretch where it's a little uncomfortable? So we get them thinking creatively outside of the context that, that they're lost in. I'm thinking like, it's all, you know, you say like burn the ships. It's like burn the ships, but like don't burn down all the trees on the island. You know, keep yep. those trees. Still give yourselves another option later on, right? <laughs> yeah. Some people need to burn the ships. Some people can't. I did. When I started this business, I literally left my previous career with like nothing. Like no money. I had to borrow money. But for me, and I did a lot of soul searching, it was the right thing, right? We don't want to make stupid mistakes. One of the things that I knew was I knew I was going to make it. I knew I'd do anything I had to. So different strokes for different folks. Yeah, the safety net is... I was just thinking the safety net is really bad. You know, picture you going across, uh, going across a line, across a valley or something. You know, you got the safety net down below. If you're just crawling like this, yeah, then you're not going to move very fast. 
But, you know, if you know that safety net's there and you're just trying to sprint across, it's like, oh, I got it. All right, back up. Keep going, keep going. And that's your personality. If you can recognize that, then, the, yeah, that's a pretty good path for you. Yeah. But I, I love that just because I think – because the more I've thought about that problem set of, you know, is it is pressure that good or is the safety net good, you know, trying to, trying to make it a little bit black and white just for the simplicity of an answer, that's one of the things I usually come to is that it's like that personal component to it of, well, how do you act with the safety net versus how do you act when you burn the boats? Yeah, I I would probably in my work try to get them out of either either of those, because hmm. either of those is not a full expression of who they are. It is some amount of gaining security, which is just fear, right? If we need security, that's a fear of insecurity. And on the other side, just the the pressure, pressure, pressure to succeed, that's insecurity and fear too. We want to get people hmm. outside of the realm. Hmm of fear so that they can be the full expression of who they are as an entrepreneur and not pushed or pulled in any particular direction so that they are free to create whatever they want outside of any amount of fear. Now I got to ask then, do we have a metaphor or analogy that works with that? Cause we got the burn the ships. That one doesn't quite work. The safety net over, you know, over the tightrope doesn't quite work. You got one. We, we could just be spitballing here. if you need. <laughs> this is where I'm, I lack creativity, Camden. Can you see one? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I do not yet, but I, you know, I'll probably email you later today. Cause that's going to be sent back. Ways, it's like <laughs> the, you know, it, like the, the Buddhist tradition is like the middle way. If we're being felt pushed or pulled, it is not a full expression of who us or who we are. So what might the middle way be? That's a All good right. way of putting it. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say <clears throat> Buddhism got it. We're good. Exactly. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know, maybe yeah. I'll come up with an analogy, but that that is that's even if I'm not right, I just quoted Buddha, so it sounds good. <laughs> there you go. It sounds really, really important. And and if you got it even ninety percent correct, one of the things that we've learned on here on uh, our show is that. Quotes don't have to be correct. Mm. <laughs> we accept that. Yeah. I want you to get the meaning out there. That's man. the most important part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We joke about that all the time. And I'm going to I'm gonna tell you, talking about joking and learning and these quotes and memorizing. For me, what I learned today was, where'd it go? There it is. All right. I knew I'd wrote it down was the to don't list. I just love that idea of the reminder. You know, I talk with guys all the time about where they want to be in the future, who and what, and, and most of them are like, I, I just don't know. Uh, you know, I really don't know well, about things you don't want to be. You know, you start taking things off the table, you get a more clear view of what's on the table. And by doing this, don't do these things list, you get more clarity in what it is you need to do and those things that will move you forward. So I appreciate that. And that's what I learned today. Camden, how about you? What'd you learn? I was going to say in the spirit of paraphrasing quotes, isn't that Michelangelo talking about with the block of marble to make David, you just remove everything that isn't David, yeah. right? That's the easy path forward. <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah. Hey, 90% accuracy. No, that's, that, you're <laughs> but no, dead on. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the piece for me was, I mean, honestly, it's twofold because these are two, you know, Andy, you said this yourself, Dad. I know we've said it on the show before of it's always the like the doctor heal thyself is the hardest part, whether it's coaching or any other aspect, turning it inward. And there were two pieces that I'm putting in my back pocket, which is the screw realistic of just push those goals out even further. Uh, you know, maybe go for three gallons of water instead of two, whatever, get a little crazy with it. But also the process goals of making those, uh, putting those processes into your day, making that the goal so that those processes can get you the outcome that you're looking for rather than being so focused on the outcome. So I love those twofold for me today. Awesome. Andy, how about you, man? What'd you learn? Um, so I learned a ton. First off, I learned, I like you guys a ton. Um, you could chat all day long. One of the things that was more of like a reminder was Otis talking about his days in special forces. And it reminded me so much of how good leadership is in the military. I love um, reading about a lot of that. One of the things that strikes me is their level. You, you think these dudes are like big, gruff, and which they are, Otis. But they're also incredibly <laughs> reflective and vulnerable. And I think in terms of leadership, that can't be underscored enough in terms of the importance of being a great leader. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So Andy, what's the new website after the rebrand? How can folks get in con- contact with you? Uh, learn more about what you're going on at Scaling Minds. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, scalingminds.com, just the way it sounds. Scaling as in scaling a business, minds.com. Um, I do have uh, some goodies there if any of your listeners might be interested. Um, if you go to scalingminds.com slash COS for Camden Oda Show, uh, I didn't have the rebrand when I created that. Um, but there's a couple <laughs> of um, assessments there which I think could be really helpful. One is a leadership assessment. One is a entrepreneurial fitness assessment. Um, And there's also, uh, if anybody is interested in having a conversation, there's a place to book some time there. Um, Currently, the big thing that we're, we're enrolling, like you guys, I run a mastermind and we're enrolling. uh, Ours is called Entrepreneurs Rising. Um, It's a very intimate mastermind of about five uh, entrepreneurs. Um, and we have about two spots left starting in January. Um, it's a a great place to get your own board of directors and strategize for 2024. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. And thank you so much for joining us today. Andy, taking the time. Candy, I really, really appreciate it. Such a fun conversation. Awesome. Well, I guess I'll tell myself to run it out. That feels weird, but but here we go. All right. Thank y'all for listening to today's episode of 10X Your Team with Cam and Otis. And a special thanks to our guest, Andy Height, for joining us today. Remember, you can watch full episodes of the show on YouTube at 10X Your Team. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to pass along with other lifelong learners in your tribe so they can enjoy it too. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. As always, the full archive of episodes is available at www.10xyourteam.net. Thanks again. We'll see you all next time. Thanks so much, Camden. Really appreciate the conversation.